Welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hurts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark, and I'm so excited that you decided to connect today. Right now, grab something to take notes with as we begin today's message. Good morning, church. We are in a series titled How to Read Your Bible, and this is the third week I strongly recommend if you did not see weeks one and two, go back and check those out because they are great. And since we're talking about the Bible, on Wednesday nights from 6 to 9 p.m., we have our Wednesday night Bible study. If you're enjoying learning about the Bible, want to know more about how to apply it to your life, have conversations, ask questions, Wednesday night Bible study is your chance to. Let's look at our main passage for today's service. And this is the Apostle Paul writing to his spiritual son named Timothy, which is why the name of the book is 2 Timothy. It's Paul's second letter to Timothy. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14 through 17, he says this, But as for you, so Paul to Timothy, as for you, Timothy, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy or as a child you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. All scripture, everybody say all scripture. Is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, we come to you today in Jesus' name. And Lord, we thank you that there is power in your word. Lord, I pray today that as we hear your word, that hearts are transformed, that minds are transformed and made new, and that everyone would hear what they have in store for them today. Lord, I thank you today that you are a healer. Lord, we pray for anyone who might not be feeling well in their body. We declare that by your stripes that we are healed. We thank you for these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So to start off today's sermon, I want to start off with a little short story because why not start with a little short story? Everyone say, ooh. There once was a secret society that existed inside of a corrupt government. Ooh. There you go. This secret society promised revolution and freedom to anyone who would join. The government hated this society because they were a threat to the power system that they had so carefully maintained. The current ringleader of the secret society managed a network of assassins known as the Sons of the Shadows. Ooh, yeah. (laughs) The Sons of the Shadows had one simple goal, to spread the message of this society at any cost. These sons knew that at least half of them would be publicly murdered for this mission, but decided that the message was worth the cost. The ringleader used to dream of having biological children and being married one day, but life had a different plan for him. He decided that he would treat these sons of the shadows as his own biological children. And though he loved all of them, he especially loved one young prodigy named Tim. He was sure that Tim would carry on his legacy one day. This young man named Tim, although he was extremely gifted, he heavily relied on his mentor to guide him and teach him the proper way to operate in the society. One day as Tim was studying as he always studied, he receives a letter covered in blood that he was terrified to open. He asked the mailman, who is this letter from? And the young man who brings the letter refuses to look into his eyes, and he simply says, it's from dad. Tim says, are you positive it's from him? How do you know it's from him? The young man tries to speak. He opens his mouth, but no words come out. He nods his head, puts his head down, and walks away with tears running down his eyes. Tim, with his hand shaking, opens up the letter and confirms that his worst nightmare is now his reality. His mentor was captured and is being tortured for crimes against the government. The mentor, while in prison, 
makes a deal with one of the guards who would listen to him, that he will teach him the hidden knowledge of the secret society in exchange for a pen and paper. And this once mighty ringleader who would stand on the street corners with this message is now speaking only through letters. The ringleader tells Tim in this letter that his execution date has been set and he accepts the fact that he will never see his son again. Knowing that he now needs to prepare his son for his death, the tone of this letter is much different than previous conversations. The ringleader is instructing Tim on how to transition from being a student to a teacher, how to go from being a follower to a leader. It was now time for the son to step up and be a father to the next generation. With the tears of Tim mixing on the letter of the tears of his mentor as he wrote the letter, he realizes while reading this letter that all that he ever needed was found within the ancient book that they would study together every day. That the voice of his mentor was simply reminding him of the lessons that were found within this book. This book was the voice that guided him from the time he was a child. And Tim realized that he would not be fatherless, but that there was a voice that was guiding him the whole time. Maybe you caught it, but this little story is the story of the Apostle Paul writing to his son Timothy in the book of 2 Timothy. When I was in a meeting on Tuesday, I got to hear from a true giant in the Christian faith. And this man is very sick and he knows that his days are numbered. And I wasn't even on the video call, but I was sitting at the end of the table. And as this man is speaking, he is speaking like a father giving the most important lessons to his spiritual sons. All Tuesday during that hour and a half, I scribbled down as many notes as I can. And this is the same context of the book of 2 Timothy. In 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 6, which is the end of this letter, the apostle Paul says to his spiritual son, as for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have remained faithful. You see, I've always read the book of 2 Timothy as a letter from one friend to another. But the reality is, 2 Timothy is a father preparing his spiritual son for his imminent death. And the reason why I want to take so much time to explain exactly the context of this passage is that this is something that is known as context. Everybody say context. What context is when we're studying the Bible is the surrounding information, circumstances, and background that provide a framework for understanding a particular passage, verse, or book within the Bible. As we're in this series on how to read the Bible, context is one of the most important things that we need to understand and learn how to read within. We study the context and we focus on the context because it helps us to better understand what God is speaking. It helps us to better understand what the author was getting at when he wrote the book. When I went back after Tuesday's meeting and read the book of 2 Timothy as a father preparing his son for his death, there's a level of urgency within the pages. There's a level of, Timothy, you've got to do this now. And then even this morning as I was reading through it, one of the last sentences, Paul, knowing that he's going to die, he says to Timothy, come quickly, please. He says, come quickly, wanting to see his son one more time. As we understand the urgency that's here with the voice of the Apostle Paul, it helps us to better recognize how we are to look at this book, 2 Timothy. If you've been here for the last two weeks, Pastor Mike has focused really a lot on the context of each passage. Every time we read a Bible chapter and we're in verse 20, he starts at verse 1 to give us a good picture. And I want to do that today with 2 Timothy chapter 3. I want to paraphrase the first 15 verses. So in this letter, from a father preparing his son for his death, 
the Apostle Paul starts with a really encouraging message. He pretty much says to his son Timothy, things are really bad, and they're going to get a whole lot worse. Yay. Thanks, Dad. He says, people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, without love, without self-control. People are going to love pleasure more than they love God. And as every church has said for the last 2,000 years, oh, he's talking about today. This is describing our society. Paul tells Timothy, things are getting bad. In verses 6 through 10, he gives him another word of encouragement. He says, Timothy, not only are things bad in the world, but things are messed up in the church as well. Yay. Thanks, Dad. He says that there are evil pastors and leaders who are taking advantage of gullible people, and they sell them a counterfeit faith or a false gospel. And as every church has said for the last 2,000 years, oh, he's talking about today. So the Apostle Paul lays out a big problem in front of his son Timothy, but he also gives a solution. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10, the Apostle Paul, so he says, here's all the issues going on in the world. But then he says, you, Timothy, you, however, know about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecutions, and sufferings. What kind of things have happened to me at Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra? The persecutions I endured. Yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. The Lord rescued me from all of them. So as this father is preparing his son for his death, what does he point to? The goodness of God. He says, yes, there's going to be issues, but look at how God delivered me from all of them. He lists 12, 12 verses of issues with a simple answer. It is God who delivered me from all these problems. So as a side note, when you've been through something and God has brought you through it, make sure you share your story. Make sure you share your story. You never know how your, impact, your story can impact eternity. You never know how sharing how down you were and how God came in and rescued you. You never know how that can change somebody's life forever. The Apostle Paul says to his son in verse 12, In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. While evildoers and imposters go from bad to worse, deceiving others and being deceived. So Paul tells his son, he says, listen, things are bad in the world. Things are bad right now in the church. But in spite of all of that, you have seen how God has delivered me. And I know that this is a lot of context, but this is the foundation on which we read the next few verses, which is our main passage for today. 2 Timothy 3, 14, he says, but as for you, Timothy, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed. There's all these problems, but you, my son, keep doing what you're doing. Keep believing what you have learned, knowing from whom you learned it. Verse 15, and how from childhood, everybody say childhood. From childhood, you have known the holy scriptures that are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Now watch what's happening here. There's the mentor and there's the student. The mentor knows that he's going to die soon. So what does he tell the student? The scriptures are able to instruct you. He's telling him, you followed the scriptures from your childhood. Before you ever met me, you knew the scriptures, and the scriptures are able to instruct you. So Timothy, if you had an instructor before you ever met me, you're going to have an instructor after I die. 
He's making the point that it was the scriptures that were guiding him the entire time. The scriptures will instruct you. The word of God will teach you. And you've heard this voice ever since you were a child. Question, is there any Star Wars fans in the room today? Wave at me. Some of y'all is like, I'm on a church date, Pastor. Um, I haven't shared that part of me with her yet, so. I'm a DM you after service, okay? Just know I'm here. If you've ever seen Star Wars, the main character is named Luke. So there's Luke Skywalker, and he's known as a Jedi Knight. Think of, let's just call it a superhero if you've never seen Star Wars. And these Jedi Knights, they were powered by a spiritual element known as the Force, the force right? So Luke Skywalker is powered by the Force. This Force is what guided them, gave them power, and gave them instructing. This man, Luke Skywalker, had a mentor named Obi-Wan Obi-Wan Kenobi. And while Obi-Wan was alive, he would say this famous line to Luke over and over. He would say, use the? He would say, use the force, Luke. Luke is in a moment where he's trying to do something. Obi-Wan would tell him, use the force, Luke. There's a moment when he gets into a battle and he's getting overpowered. Use the force, Luke. If you need guidance in an area, use the force, Luke. You're stuck in an area, use the force, Luke. Eventually, Obi-Wan Kenobi dies. He actually lays down his own life. And Luke Skywalker is in a battle without his mentor. And as he's stuck and doesn't know what to do, guess what the voice he hears in his head says? Use the? Use the force. Obi-Wan, being a good mentor, told his spiritual son, rely on the force because I'm not always going to be with you, but the force will. And the Apostle Paul, being a good mentor to his spiritual son, Timothy, he says, use the scriptures. You need to teach somebody? Use the scriptures. You're stuck at a moment in your life? Use the scriptures. You need guidance? Use the scriptures. Why? The scriptures will be here when I am gone. It is the scriptures that was the voice that he was always following. Think about it. The Apostle Paul is dying, and he tells his son that the Bible is able to instruct you. Paul doesn't point to the times and say, look at the times when we studied together. He says, no, look at the times before you met me as a child learning the scriptures. And even though I'm passing away, you have the same instructor that you had before you ever met me. I love that the Apostle Paul doesn't say, Timothy, I'm going to pass away. I need you to go and follow Apollos now. I need you to go follow one of the other Bible leaders. He says, follow the scriptures. Follow the word of God. He says, the scriptures are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. If you ask me to summarize the Bible in one sentence, I would say it's all about salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. If you ask me to summarize the gospel, I'd say it's about salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. How does one make it to heaven? Salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. So if the scriptures are able to lead you in the most important message ever told, guess what? It can guide you in your entire life. So how do we read this Bible? We have to understand that the Bible is not a study guide to life. It is the answer key. The Bible is not a study guide for life. It is the answer key. You know the difference between a study guide and an answer key? A study guide is a bunch of students saying, here's what might be on the test. An answer key is the instructor saying, here's exactly what you need to be successful. The Bible is the answer key. It's God saying, here's exactly what you need to be successful. I want to encourage you today, if you're looking for answers in your life, start with the answer key. If you're stuck and need encouragement, start with the answer key. If you're unsure on how to go about a situation, start with the answer key. 
And listen, I get it. I know the feeling of wanting to search everything. When I've got an issue, I work at a church, I'm preaching on a Sunday, and you're going to find me on Google like, um, how? And then Google's not doing it, so I go to chat GPT. Give me 40 solutions to this problem, please. The point that I'm getting at today is that not that it's wrong to go look for answers, but why not start with the answer key before looking at a study guide? The Apostle Paul lays this strong foundation for Timothy. There's issues in the world. You've seen how God has delivered me. Scripture is able to instruct you. And then we get to our main passage for today. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, where he says, all Scripture is God-breathed. Everybody say, God-breathed. God-breathed. He says, all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching Rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. I'd assume as Timothy is reading this letter that Paul would teach him, that Paul would rebuke him, that Paul would correct him, that Paul would train him in righteousness. And he's saying, look, it's the scriptures that do all these things so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. He's saying the scriptures equip you for every good work. If somebody is a plumber and they have a plumbing apprentice, they're going to prepare them for all the situations they might come across so that they can be successful. If someone's a teacher and they're raising up another teacher, they're going to train them on all the things they need to be successful as a teacher. Paul, being a spiritual father, is going to prepare his spiritual son. And he says that it is the scripture that equips you for every good work. That word God breathed is the Greek word theonoustos, which means inspired by God or literally from the breath of God. God breathed. And as we were studying this this week, Pastor Mike, he showed me that this verse is the only time we see this word, theonoustos, in all of Greek literature. Not just in the Bible, which was written, the New Testament in Greek, but in all the Greek language, this word is only used once. How fitting is it that the Apostle Paul creates a new word in his dying letter to emphasize how important the scriptures are, just how inspired and God-breathed they are. Does God use human authors? Absolutely. But the words are fully inspired by him. And I believe that as we read scripture, this is the lens that we read it through. Not merely that some men wrote some words down on the page, but that these are the very words of God. The scripture is the absolute truth. And I love that Paul says to Timothy that you've been instructed in the scriptures even as a child. And you might be saying, oh, come on, Pastor Josh. Can a child really be instructed in the scriptures? Can the scriptures really affect a four-year-old? Let's say that God, in his infinite wisdom and intellect, he's over here, right? Then we're going to walk all the way down to a four-year-old. And this is the intellect of a four-year-old, absolute nothing. And you know where I rank in my intellect? Psych. (laughs) Right here. In comparison to God's infinite wisdom, I'm at the level of a newborn baby. So if God can speak to me, he can speak to your children. Do not take for granted even three minutes a night reading the Bible with your kids. Those those words are still in me to this day. To this day. I used to hate those songs we would sing. But it worked. I still know the scriptures. Listen to what Jerome said. The scriptures are shallow enough for a baby to come and drink without fear of drowning and deep enough for a theologian to swim in it without ever reaching the bottom. This is the power of scripture. If you are brand new to the Christian faith, I wanna encourage you, read the scriptures because God will speak to you. 
If you've memorized the Bible over the last 80 years, I want to encourage you, read the scriptures because God will speak to you. God speaks through his word. The God of the universe decided that he would speak to us and prepare us for this journey called life through his word. And he didn't just give us a study guide. He quite literally gave us the answer key. He gave us exactly what we needed to be successful. Let me ask you, if there is a book that had all the answers to the deepest questions of life, wouldn't you want to read it? Wouldn't you want those answers? Now it does take work. And I think that's where it's easy to get stuck. Life does get so busy. But I promise you, you can do more in just a few minutes a day than you could ever trying to do it all in your own knowledge and in your own wisdom. So how do I apply this to my life today, Pastor Josh? How can I summarize this message? Number one, context is king. Context is king. I'll be, I'll be completely honest. I've read this book, 2 Timothy, so many times. I've read so many times the Apostle Paul saying that he's going to die soon. And it wasn't until I sat in that meeting on Tuesday and felt the weight of that man's voice in this Zoom call that I understood why Paul is so urgent as he's giving this message to his son, Timothy. By understanding the context of a Bible passage, we are best equipped and have a foundation to understand what God is saying to us through the Holy Spirit. We can be certain of this, that God did not select perfect people when he wrote the scriptures. That God did not look for people who had no issues in their life before he chose them to write the scriptures. But he he chose flawed people like you and me And I want you to understand that these scriptures still apply to us today. Now you might say, oh, come on. The scriptures are so outdated. It's been 2,000 years. We need new writings. You're right. Thou shall not murder. Throw that away. Thou shall not steal. Throw it away. Even though the scriptures were written 2,000 years ago, I need us to understand that technology has changed the world a whole lot but it has not changed humanity's need for a savior. It's changed a whole lot, but it has not changed our need for a savior. Sometimes we think we are so more advanced than people of the past. And then I saw a video. It was the funniest thing. It was a bunch of animals and they dumped food and all the animals run in and they're grabbing all the food. And then they cut to a video of people getting toilet paper during the pandemic. I was like, in our high heels, (laughs) acting like a bunch of animals. We think we're so much further from the past. But the reality is there are aspects of humanity that are never going to change. The Bible talks about how to go through relationships, how to deal with the heartbreak, how to love those who are around you, how to treat those who are around you, finances, all these things that we still have today in spite of all the changes. Number two, show me the Bible facts. Show me the Bible facts. Has anyone here ever heard this phrase, show me the car facts? Between the car facts and the J.G. Wentworth commercial, that's like half my brain storage gone. Like if I ever need a structured settlement and need cash now, like 877 cash now. See, we know it. The idea of the car facts is you have a big decision to make, you should get all the information from us. Well, when we have a big decision in our lives, or we feel stuck and we need guidance, show me the Bible facts. What does God have to say about this situation? For example, if you're feeling anxious, you're str- struggling with anxiety, Philippians 4, 6, let's look at the Bible facts. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ. That's the Bible facts. I don't want to forgive someone. You don't know how they mistreated me. Ephesians 4.32 
Be kind and com compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ and God forgave you. We are able to forgive others because Christ first forgave us. If you ever find yourself in a moment where you need guidance, I want to encourage you, look at the Bible facts. Number three, understand that scripture is God-breathed. By the Apostle Paul calling all scripture theonustos or God-breathed, he's making the case that these are inspired by God. The very voice of God is on the words of these pages. When we read the scriptures, our posture is not, here's what I think God should have said, or here's what I want the Bible to say. It's, here's what God is saying, let me align myself with him. Amen. Now you might say, well, I disagree with God's word on this subject. Is that okay as a Christian? It absolutely is. It absolutely is okay to be wrong. There's nothing wrong with being wrong. It happens to all of us. We could disagree with God over and over, but God in his infinite wisdom and his mercy and his knowledge, he has given us the answer key. Imagine going to your professor and saying, professor, I know what your 40 years of research said about this topic, but my study God, I wrote it different, so you need to change your answer. It's like the Bible says that the foolishness of God is greater than the greatest wisdom of mankind that we cannot even come close to God and his wisdom and his knowledge. My point right now is that in the moments where we might read a scripture and it's difficult and we're wrestling with it, we don't want to do it, I want to encourage you to follow the voice of God. Follow the scriptures. There was a moment one time in a time of worship where I was worshiping and then I remember this Bible verse that if you have, if anyone has an issue with you, Leave your gift at the altar and go and be reconciled to them. Go and make peace. And I'm like, time to go make peace. Guess how I felt after? Amazing. I could sing out of key on the front row all day. Know what my act of worship was in that moment? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Those two words were better than any worship song we could have sang. I'm sorry can be a phrase of worship. I forgive you can be a phrase of worship to God. I love you can be a phrase of worship. Would you please forgive me can be a phrase of worship. Because worship is not just about songs that we sing. It's about a heart that surrenders to God. And in his word, if he's giving us these things to do, don't just look at it as, oh, I have to do this. Don't do it grudgingly. Do it as an act of worship to God. So we understand that context is king. Look up the Bible facts and remember that scripture is God breathed. Remember that these authors of scripture looked at the Bible this way, not for no good reason. These men, they walked and talked with Jesus. They saw blind eyes open. They saw a dead man rise back to life. They wrote letters. The apostle Peter, he was being crucified for being a follower of Jesus. You know what this man did? You know how crazy he was? He said, don't you dare crucify me in the way my Lord was. You flip this cross upside down. And they crucified him upside down. That is the level of commitment that you have when you see a dead man rise back to life. And we are reading those words of those men still today. To conclude our story that we started at the beginning, the young man, although he realized that his mentor was dying, took his place and he stepped out as a leader. The letter that the mentor had sent to him was not just for him, but was for Christians who would live for thousands of years after he died. As the legend has it, in the year 2024, in light of all that was going on, that people would leave their warm homes on a Sunday morning to go and learn from these letters. Paul and Timothy had no idea at the time, but in over 2,000 years, a little more than 2,000 years, over 2.3 billion people would join this underground society. 
Timothy was very clear when asked, how do I become a member of this society? He simply says, you have to place your trust in our founder and our Lord, Jesus Christ. So if you're here today and you've never made a decision to follow Jesus, I want to give you an opportunity to join the family of God today. We do it by praying a prayer. Repeat after me. Say, dear God, I come to you today just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I believe that you died and rose for me. Come into my heart. Come into my life to change me and make me new. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. My name is Pastor John Mark, and I'm so glad we were able to connect together today. If this impacted you in any way, I need you to do a few things for me. I need you to like and subscribe to this channel and head over to FamilyChurchNY.com to take your next steps.